Last fall, I came across an article had a very intriguing title. The article was entitled, Why Are Christians So Bad at Forgiveness? Again, that was the, uh, the title of the article, Why Are Christians So Bad at Forgiveness? And um, you might uh, uh, know that right away it catches your attention, um, but it also maybe rings true, hits home, that very often so many of us who profess faith in Christ, we're not very good at forgiving. If we can't admit it about ourselves, surely we know somebody else um, who's a Christian who goes to church or professes faith in Christ. We know that they hold on to grudges, that they somehow can't um, find a way to, to let go of the past. Again, a question worth asking Why are Christians so bad at forgiveness? Now, there's no question we're meant to forgive. Um, The lessons that uh, uh, Jan has just read for us this morning say clearly, um, because God has been forgiving to us, we need to be forgiving in turn to others. So it's, it's a priority. It's something we're meant to live and do. And yet, for so many of us, it's something we don't do very well if we do it at all. Now, the suggestion with the article was is because it's hard work. It's not easy to to forgive. And our lessons today help flesh that out for us. They help us to understand what it means to say that it's not easy to forgive. And I say that because... um, Very often we carry in our heads some understandings of what we think forgiveness means or or what it would look like. And very often we think it ought to be something easy because there are two things I want to highlight today. One is that sometimes we think that, that forgiving means forgetting, and that's not easy. And also we think forgiving means kind of being passive, of doing nothing. So let me try to flesh those out for you today. Let me try to help amplify why those things require some work on our parts. That first thing, that that forgiving is not forgetting. And I know that there's a cliche, it says forgive and forget, that somehow we want to equate the two things. But it's hard and sometimes we shouldn't forget. But on the other hand, our commandment is to forgive. I go back to the lesson that Jesus tells, the parable that he gives about the king who, uh, who, who decides to settle accounts with all his servants. And one of them owes him a great deal of money, and the king calls that servant in and asks that uh, the servant would repay him. The servant's not able to, and so he begs to have his debt forgiven. And Jesus, in telling the story, says the king is willing to do so. He uses that word forgive. He forgives the debt. But then the story continues on, and the memory of that debt doesn't disappear because what happens in the story as it continues on is that very same servant who had had his debt forgiven now is confronted by uh, and runs into another servant who owes him money and who then also asks for the same kind of forgiveness that that first servant has received. Only he's unwilling to do so. And the whole matter gets brought back to the king. Now, what I want to say, and it maybe sounds obvious, but nowhere along the line, in all of this talk about forgiveness, nowhere along the line is anybody forgetting that a debt has been forgiven. Nobody tries to to act as though uh, somehow uh, the memory of that has gone away. You see, what I wanted to try to suggest to you today is, is if it sounds hard to forgive and forget, that's clearly so. Very often, the forgetting is not really what we're asked to do. Uh, This was brought home to me uh, uh, just this past fall in an online discussion I happened to see where there was a man who was sharing uh, 
his childhood experience of being abused. The man had a relative who he has since now understood was suffering from a mental illness. But this man as a child had a relative who would literally tie him up and bind him and leave him lying on the floor in the darkness. He did it over and over again, something that was terrifying to this man as a child. Well, in sharing this story, uh, the man said that he has, uh, he hopes, learned to forgive his relative. He understands intellectually about the man's illness. He understands and he doesn't want any harm done to his relative. But he says he will never forget what happened. As a matter of fact, even though he's had therapy and gone to counseling, he still has nights where he wakes up literally terrified. He's kind of wrapped up in his sheets or his blankets and feels like he's bound all over again and he's that little boy lying on the floor. It's not what's required, he says. He will never forget. He will carry the memory probably as long as he lives. But again, he could speak of forgiving his relative, of not wishing the relative harm, of not wanting some kind of repayment in return. You see, what I'm trying to get at is, is maybe we make this whole thing of, of, of forgiving uh, too hard, and that's why we're not very good at it, because somehow we think we're bound to forget when we can't. That's one thing. The other thing is, is that sometimes we think of forgiving as being just something passive that we do, that if we're going to forgive somebody, we're done, and there's nothing we can do. And the reality of the matter is, is forgiving usually is a very active thing that we do. To truly forgive, it requires some work on our part. It requires us maybe doing some things that we wouldn't normally do, but that's bound up in true forgiveness. I think, for example, of what took place in the nation of South Africa. You might remember that roughly three decades ago, the, the whole system of apartheid uh, was uh, ended. A and, and just to make sure, you know, apartheid was that system whereby people of color, who in the vast majority were separated out from people who were deemed to be white, who were in a very small minority, and the white minority ruled over that, uh, that majority of people of color. And, and there was this whole elaborate legal system set up to divide one from the other so that only those who were white had privileges. They could live wherever they chose to live and do whatever they chose to do. People of color were separated out and, and regimented and set apart in a number of ways. But finally, even though that persisted for many years, finally at long last, due to international pressure, that legal system of apartheid came to an end. Uh, democracy was instituted and, and, and the majority of people of color were allowed to, to once again make their nation their own. Only what part of the negotiations, part of ending apartheid, was the understanding that there would not be um, uh, recriminations, that, that people who were guilty of certain things w would not be um, uh, held uh, in, uh, you know, by the new regime, that there would be kind of a general amnesty for everyone, no matter what had happened. And that was agreed to, that was accepted. Only um, when the majority of people of color came into power, they insisted that there be what they called a, a, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was presided over by a Methodist bishop, as a matter of fact. But the idea was that even though there would not be any punishment for people's past actions, those past actions would be carefully preserved, recorded, and written down so that no matter how far in the future uh, history goes, there would never be any dispute about what apartheid had been like. Uh, there would never be what we might call Holocaust deniers uh, in our own time of people who would say, oh, well, it wasn't that bad or it, it didn't happen. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was designed to uncover everything that took place and to carefully record it so it would be always preserved. 
That was a lot of work. A lot of work that maybe seems as though it was just uh, unnecessary, but it wasn't unnecessary. It was a whole part of people putting the past behind and beginning to forgive one another. It required work. Or let me offer another example. Uh, when I was a superintendent in Richmond, there was a church one day called me and asked me to come meet with the committee because they were dealing with a particular issue in the life of their church. There was a man who had grown up in the church, had been a part of the church, but then had been convicted and sent to prison for sexual abuse. The man served his term, came home, and then he called the pastor of the church and asked if it would be okay if he started attending worship again. And that's where they called me and asked him to come meet with them to, to think about what they might choose to do. And when we gathered together, I was pleased that the church was emphatic. They wanted that man to come to church. They said, if anybody needs to hear about how God forgives us and how we can start over, surely this man does. Only they said in the same way, we don't want to act like the past didn't happen. We need to be careful, protect anybody still around today. So after a great deal of work, the church came up with a covenant, a really a literal written document that the gentleman was asked to sign in which there were boundaries put. That what was understood is he was free to come to church and in fact the church wanted him to come to church. But... He was only allowed to come to the sanctuary and that if he were to ever go any place else in the church, he had to be accompanied by an adult so that he would have to get an usher if he wanted to go get a drink of water, if he would need to go to the bathroom, he would have to get an usher to literally go with him to make sure that he was always in the company of another adult. If that sounds like a lot of work, it was. But that's what I'm trying to get at. To forgive in that setting was not something passive. It was not something that you just kind of shrugged your shoulders and said, bygones be bygones. No, it was an effort to give this man a chance to start over, but in a responsible way, a way that took the past seriously and protected the future. See, that's why I, I, I circle back. And I say that's maybe why we are not that good at this whole thing of forgiveness. Because it requires, it requires a lot of us. It requires remembering. It requires taking action. It's not just something you do lightly. It's something you just do without any effort. Maybe that's why we sometimes fall short. We and maybe everybody else. Forgiveness, true forgiveness, is not easy. But let me leave you with this. We do it. We try to do it. Because always in the act of forgiving, there is a great gift that gets given. I think, for instance, of an experience I had many years ago. Uh, my family, we lived in Warrington, and where we lived, where the parsonage was, there was a, a, an older couple who lived next door who weren't members of the church, but we knew, came to know pretty well. And uh, I, I would run into him out in the yard. We were both doing yard work, and we'd have conversation. Everything seemed to be fine until the day came that our family got a dog. And shortly after we got the dog, uh, I ran into my neighbor and he said to me, he said, I see you all got a dog. And I said, yes, and I should have known right away this was going to be a problem. He said, well, just make sure that dog never comes into my yard. Well, I did hear those words, and as near as I was able, I made sure our dog never went into his yard until there was one day we had a really heavy snowfall. And our two sons, they were, I think, four and six. They went out to play in the snow, build a snowman, and to play around. And the dog was scratching the door. The dog could hear him outside. And I thought, what harm can it do? Let me let the dog out to run around with the two 
sons, which I did. And the dog ran around with the two sons, and eventually they all came inside. But it was later that afternoon that I heard this pounding on the front door. And I went to the front door, and there was my neighbor, and he was irate. I could just tell by his body language. He was as angry as he could be. And he immediately launched in. He said, you let your dog go into my yard. I thought I told you not to. He said, look at the tracks. Tracks went from our house over to his yard. No denying our dog had gone over into his yard. He said, I told you not to do this. You should never have let that dog loose. And I immediately launched into trying to apologize and try to explain what the unusual circumstances were. He didn't care. He didn't want to hear it. He was just angry. He said, never let that happen again. And he stomped away. Well, I will want to quickly say I was at fault. It was my mistake. I had done what I shouldn't have done, letting the dog loose just to run around anywhere it wanted to go. But here's why I'm telling you this story. What was disturbing to me about this is the fact that from that moment forth, that neighbor never spoke to me again. And I mean that literally. He never said another word to me again. Next time I saw him in the yard, I tried to approach him that I could apologize one more time. He immediately turned his back, went inside. And what I discovered is that from that moment on, any time, he was out, I came out, came anywhere close to him, he'd turn his back and go back inside. He literally never spoke to me again. I thought when he found out we were moving that maybe he'd come over to tell me he was glad to see me go. Um, he didn't even do that. He just never spoke to me again. Now, why I'm telling you about this, what bothered me about it was this. Is basically, it seemed to me by his actions, my neighbor was saying to me that I had had one chance to be a good neighbor and I had blown it. That I had messed up on my one chance, and now I was done. And what bothered me about that is, yes, I had messed up, and I had not been a good neighbor. But I really wanted to try again. I wanted a second chance. And my neighbor, by his actions, wasn't going to give me one. And I tell you about, about all of that because that's the great gift that forgiveness is. It is meant to be second chances or third chances. That all of us, sometime or another, are going to fail somebody else and maybe cause harm. But the question is, what happens then? Is that it? Are we at an end? Or is it possible at all we can start over? That's, of course, the great gift that God gives us when we fail God, is God gives us a second chance. And what we're taught today is that when we forgive, we give second chances. That's why we do so. Amen.